Well, um, Franz, when he spoke towards the end of yesterday, said it was difficult to come at that point in a workshop. How much more difficult is it to come at this point after the incredibly rich discussion we've just had and also when, in some ways, everything has been said? So what I'm going to try and do over the next 20 minutes is a kind of mixture of a little bit of tidying up, perhaps drawing together some loose ends, perhaps a little bit of conceptual mapping that might or might not help us. But I also want, um, in this particular session, in relation to these questions about steering and who steers, to raise some quite sharp questions again about power and politics and the politics of knowledge and return these very centre stage to our discussions, building on what's, what's happened in the last session. So, wait a minute, I'm going the wrong direction here. Um, the last session raised at one point the question of what kinds of transformations are we dealing with? Where are they going? As it were, where's the normative, the broad normative orientation here? And the need to declare one's personal positionalities around those things. So I will do that straight off. To me, the transformations that we're talking about here are towards sustainability, but they must also be about equality and justice. We've had quite a lot of discussion about um, the crises that the world is facing, which are not just about the difficulties of pursuing business as usual on a constrained planet, but are also deep um, crises of inequality and insecurity. And... I would see the agenda that we're all dealing with at a very broad level around transformational pathways that are about integrity in ecological terms, but they're also about respecting human rights, well-being, security, and they're about greater social equality and justice. Um, these are two books. I'm just talking basically from um, my role still is intellectually very much engaged with the Step Centre and two contributions where we've made that argument, drawing on quite a lot of literatures and different social science traditions. Uh, the book we produced a couple of years ago, Dynamic Sustainabilities, which defines sustainability as having justice as an integral part of it. And then more recently, a book that's going to be coming out early next year, um, around green transformations, which we define as needing to be green and just. But that book is fundamentally about politics, and that's partly what I want to address now. So, if we're thinking about transformations, one starting point is to recognise the S. These things are plural. Um, even taking one simple kind of diagram which attempts to relate, as it were, the environmental and the social, and this comes from the, the article that I did with Johan Rockström and Kate Rayworth for the World Social Science Report, which juxtaposes planetary boundaries, which is one way of conceptualising the big environmental challenges we're dealing with, with the no Kate Rayworth's notion of social boundaries, those fundamentals of dignity, of rights, of well-being, um, which provide a social floor, as she argues, and create a safe and just operating space for humanity. There are going to be multiple possible pathways um, that societies might pursue. Some of them may be unsafe, some of them may be unjust, and in the middle, there will be a range of alternative safe and just pathways transformative pathways to different futures, and they need to be, I think, understood as plural. In the Step Centre, we've also um, used a different kind of moniker, the idea of three Ds, to think harder about this plurality and what it means to different people. So the first D is directions. We need to ask questions about the, where different pathways are going, but also about the goals, the values, the interests that are driving and steering different pathways, and then questions about how they might be re-steered, but I'm going to come to that closely in a minute. Diversity is also really important. Diversity to respect the fact that different societies, contexts, people, groups have different values, um, and pathways and transformations need to respond to that diversity. But there's also, coming back to some of the discussions yesterday about uncertain futures, can 
the world or any society afford to put all its eggs in one basket? Or does one not also need to keep open a diversity to give the flexibility, to give the resilience, to respond to what might come up? Because there are things that we don't know about. And then distribution, which of course relates really closely to the question of equality and justice. I think we always need to be asking for any given pathway or transformation, who's going to gain or lose? How are benefits but also risks distributed? Um, and how do those processes of choice amongst pathways both respond to and in turn shape inequalities, whether those are of wealth and e economy and resource use or of power or of opportunity. And this means that when we're thinking about multiple transformations, we always need to be thinking about contestations, trade-offs, tensions, and the possibility of conflict as has been discussed. So coming back to that diagram, I think we always need to be politicizing the directions of transformation. Um, and these questions of politics come at a variety of different stages. Which pathways? So questions of, of choosing and shaping and who chooses are deeply interlocked with power relations. Um, whose boundaries and whose safety? These questions about um, environmental limits, whatever sector we're talking about, are not immutable. They are not set in stone. They are open to social interpretations and different views of what is safe and secure. At the bottom... Um, we need to be aware of the fact that um, certain kinds of environmentally secure pathways might actually undermine democracy and justice. Um, the notion that I think came up this morning in Klaus Topfer's talk um, of the ways that the imperatives for urgency or to put in place I mean, geoengineering as an example um, gives a kind of authority to certain sorts of science and politics, which might ride roughshod over questions of rights and justice. And then, of course, there's the, the question that we've been dealing with all along about sustainability of what, for whom, whose goals. So, in the Step Centre, we've been um, working with what we've called a pathways approach to try and think further and deepen the way in relation to different situations and contexts we might go about analysing these things. And the pathways approach starts with the idea of systems, recognising that in any situation there are social, institutional, ecological, technological elements which often interact in very dynamic ways. And we can think about pathways, perhaps, as being the particular directions in which these systems change over time. They do that in particular environments and contexts. But what's critical is layering over this questions about values and framing. There is no single system. Rather, systems are always framed. They're subject to different forms of understanding and representation. And this is where knowledge and science and different sorts of science come into this. So if one begins to see that out of those inherently complex realities in the world, different groups and actors are going to frame those in different ways. The actors doing that framing may well be different local people, it may be communities and businesses, it may be different state actors, but it can also be different researchers who come from diverse positionalities, disciplinary backgrounds, um, different partial perspectives, to, to turn to Donna Haraway's notion of, of feminist critiques of science. Um, all science, I think one can argue, um, is positioned and partial to some degree. And an understanding of framing turns one's attention to how different groups might frame systems in different ways. So we've got a variety of partial perspectives applied to any different situation. Now, we also talked a bit yesterday about narratives, um, about how in attempts to, to deal with and simplify inherently complex situations for the purposes of acting, um, we, and this is a very diverse we, often create and enact storylines, which can be seen very simply as stories produced by people and institutions which often start at the beginning 
with a system framed in certain ways and envisage some things that might happen um, that will lead to particular futures. We've got multiple narratives about transformation. And I think we've seen that in, in some of our, our discussions. But there are, of course, many practices that go into creating narratives, selecting certain narratives over and above others. And this is just um, a list amongst many possible practices. And I think if we look at those, we can see that they are things that apply to perhaps what policy actors or, or people or individuals might do, but they're also about the way that science and research happens. Different forms of science, different disciplines, different groupings, differently positioned perspectives in science might do all these things in different ways, might embark on these kinds of practices in very, in very, in very different ways. And I think we have to attend to some of those practices in, in thinking about the relationships that we're engaged in, in transformative knowledge. So what we end up with um, is around any situation that we might be interested in, an array of different narratives, um, legitimizing and helping to co-construct different pathways which have different distributional implications. And some of the work we've, we've done in the STEP Center has kind of explored this diversity and, and related them to actors and institutions and different kinds of science and knowledge for different situations. Very simply, um, in relation to sustainable food futures, one can identify a whole array of different narratives about futures which depend on different sorts of technologies connecting up with different institutions, have very different implications, and are underpinned by diverse kinds of science and knowledge. Or a situation I've been dealing with very directly of late in the context of the West African Ebola crisis is thinking about how, how we imagine and handle um, big health crises and epidemics where, on the one hand, many actors at the moment are working with a kind of global outbreak narrative, and yet underlying those are a diversity of other stories which are talking about the, the inherent structural violence and vulnerabilities that have created the conditions in which a crisis on the scale we're now seeing have, have, has unfurled, or that attend to diverse cultural and social relations between people and ecologies in different settings. Now, coming back more centrally to power, um, narratives and the pathways that they're co-constructed with are also shaped in relation to power and politics. And all pathways and narratives are, of course, not equal. Some often remain dominant. Some stories come to act in the world because they, they, they acquire materiality, they acquire the force of institutional power, they actually come to do things, whereas others remain marginalized simply as alternative storylines or alternative imaginations or aspirations. So I think we have to attend to several things. Um, the ways that power relations can shape lock-in to particular powerful narratives and pathways to the exclusion of others, um, but also to the dangers that some narratives might be riding roughshod over justice and the ability to avoid alternatives. Attending to alternatives, appreciating them, to use Klaus Topfer's term, is absolutely vital. Um, and science, I would see, as having a role, yes, in opening up that appreciation to alternatives, but certain kinds of science, as I've suggested, can also be part of those dominant narratives and lock-in. So, as it were, science and different sorts of science everywhere. But what constructing pathways needs to do is to recognize and foster deliberation amongst the multiplicity, amongst alternatives. But we're in a world where we often see that not happening, where actually um, appreciating alternatives has often to work against some quite power-laden forces pushing in the other direction. Um, in the step center, we've called this the politics of closing down. And it happens in at least two ways. In many situations, we see a push towards singular narratives and pathways, 
um, to the exclusion of others. We also very often see a push towards narratives that are non-transformational. Because, of course, incumbent institutions, those who hold power in any given context, often don't want transformation. The status quo or the, the lock-in along which things are moving is often very comfortable. Um, so countering, beginning to counter that, as it were, double lock-in, um, also requires a kind of double opening up, an opening up to appreciate diversity and an opening up to enable transformation. Um, now, that can involve working against and beginning to generate a counter-politics towards a variety of different pressures towards closing down. Um, some of them might be around interests. As I've suggested, incumbent institutions do tend to favour strategies which preserve the status quo. Um, that's, in a sense, a recognition of interest-based politics. I think it's also a politics of institutionalization. Um, in many situations, um, bureaucracies and institutions have formed around certain ideas of balance, of equilibrium, um, or of routine. And, and shaking up routinization is often important to enable alternatives to, to come into, into play. And sometimes um, emergencies and conflicts and crises can be moments for reflection. I'm trying to work with others at the moment to think about how the Ebola crisis might be an opportunity for reframing how a whole range of actors have thought about development and health systems and the governance of health in West Africa and beyond. Crisis can be an opportunity to de-institutionalize, to de-routinize. Um, but even when we're beginning to think about transformation and, and changes, whether incremental or radical, we also have to recognize that there are power-laden pressures to drive and to steer and to control. Yeah, I'm coming to the end. Um, much of the discussion, for instance, in the context of planetary boundaries, and I think Klaus Topfer alluded to it this morning, is looking for fixes of certain kinds. And we see an elision of transformation towards fixing things through technologies, through markets, or through big institutional fixes, global agreements around things. Um, and that, I think, is something to be guarded against. And we also have to recognize political economy. Certain pathways and, and pressures towards them are very strongly backed by finance, by materiality. Um, but there's also a politics of knowledge at work here. <clears throat> the kinds of cognitive pressures to think about things in certain ways, whether through the biases of professions or of disciplines. Media and popular knowledge, which um, again pushes things in certain directions. And then the ways that these things work, not just through a conflict-based, out-and-out explicit politics of knowledge, but actually through more subtle forms of disciplining um, of subjectivities so that people come to internalize, as, as Foucault and others would have suggested, certain ways of living and being. Um, and I think there are roles for a diversity of social science perspectives and theories of power um, in analyzing and beginning to help unravel these diverse elements of power and politics and the ways they are currently working and might work in transformation. This, in turn, I think, can help to open up and appreciate diverse pathways and drivers in a number of different ways, which move beyond top-down control and steering in single directions. And just three I'd like to throw out. Some of them have already been talked about. One is the notion of transformational alliances that sometimes we need to be addressing novel relationships between actors in different settings, but also the knowledges that they bring that begin to challenge in different ways. Um, this has happened, I think, in a number of areas. Ecological agriculture, zero carbon energy have all depended on alliances. The critical thing is that those haven't always been alliances of the like-minded. One can get, for instance, in renewable energy, um, states that want employment, um, and publics that want, that want jobs and well-being and, and cheaper fuel 
and environmentalists who are pushing in turn for the green element of those agendas. Alliances can be forged in ways that do things and help transformation, even when the motivations are not necessarily the same. Citizen pathways, we've talked a lot about. Um, building from grassroots knowledge, people's ways of being and getting by in the world, the resilience that often is formed through indigenous knowledges and the aspirations for the future contained in citizen ideas. Um, but the need to scale those things up through networks that are going big and thinking big and enabling connection without losing the groundedness in context which are so important to to making these things real and having traction on people's real lives. And finally, the notion of emergent pathways. Um, and this was touched on quite a lot yesterday in the context of the relationship between the incremental and the radical. I think if we look back on some of the big transformations that have happened in history, whether women getting the vote or the ending of slavery or any others that one might think of, They've often involved, um, to start with and throughout, um, contending diverse, even unknown ends. These were not transformations where somebody said, this is where we need to be going, and, um, and this is what needs to happen to steer and drive to get there. Um, sometimes these things, as it were, emerged on the hoof through alignments that emerged over time, through through. Ends, ends that were often unknown to begin with. So just finally, um, a few kind of key ideas that may be important in what I see as a need to move from a closing down to an opening up or fostering what one might see as a transformational politics or a politics of knowledge for sustainability and justice. An idea of change being cultured, facilitated, not just steered from the front. A notion that this needs to be multi-scale um, because we're dealing with big challenges that are global and national and regional as well as local. But the challenge of connecting scales in ways that don't lose traction with particularity. Plurality to respect and respond to this diversity of perspectives, goals, contexts. Deliberation which is crucial, um, democracy um, and inclusive debate around goals and means to get there and a democratization of science and knowledge in aligning with and helping to construct diverse narratives and pathways. There's also, um, I think, a reality that transformations will to some extent need to be adaptive. They take time and they'll need to respond and perhaps shift direction a bit as we go and they can often be alliance-based and networked. Finally, just to come to, to science and knowledge, I think we need to be quite overt about the political positionality and engagement of the knowledge that we and the many partners we're collaborating with in, in these networks um, are shaped. Um, political engagement is about recognizing position and it's sometimes about surfacing conflicts, and it's sometimes about knowing when to keep them under wraps. But this then brings in a final word, which I suppose is reflexivity, um, in our own work and in encouraging this in others, whereby we might move towards networks which are not just about bringing different forms of knowledge together, but encouraging a humility whereby all players recognize their perspectives as positioned and partial, and we foster an inclusive deliberation amongst them rather than an assumption that any particular perspective is going to win out. Thank you.